Hello guys, in this video I'll be showing you how I'm going to turn this cheap Walmart bicycle into a powerful e-bike with regenerative braking capability. This particular bicycle is 18 speeds, meaning on the rear wheel it has 6 sprockets and up here on the front cassette it has 3 sprockets. Now I'm planning to actually power the front cassette with the motor rather than having the motor directly power the rear wheel and what that allows me to do is that I could take advantage of the existing gearing already on the bike to multiply the torque so what I'm planning to have is that the motor um, shaft will spin a gear um, and that will move the chain and the chain will be meshed with this largest sprocket at the front here and now I'm planning to modify this front sprocket and add uh, an even smaller chain ring at the back here, uh, probably about 18 teeth, um, to drive the chain going to the rear wheel. And what that will do is that it will multiply the torque many times over by having this large cog or um, sprocket drive a smaller sprocket here and have the smaller sprocket drive the rear wheel. However, a problem with this is that um, the pedals and the sprockets are basically connected together and they're one unit so let's say if the motor is powering this cassette this will the pedal will spin at a very dangerous rpm so I'll need to isolate the pedals from the cassette using something called a freewheel so this is what a freewheel looks like and this is this is basically what will make the uh, the power uh, transmission possible from the motor to the rear wheel without turning the pedals so this is essentially a one-way clutch and the inside and outside can turn at different uh, speeds. So let's say if the pedals are um, connected to the axle are threaded onto the inside portion uh, of this freewheel, and as I pedal along, the entire thing will turn as a single unit, like so, because the clutch will lock up. But if the uh, the chain rings um, start moving because the motor is powering them, and they're connected, they will be connected to the outside portion. Then they could spin separately keeping the inside part stationary and thus also keeping the pedal stationary. So this should allow um, the power transmission from the motor to the wheels without turning the pedals. It would also allow um, me to pedal normally if let's say the battery ran out of power. Also by allowing the motor to power the front cassette rather than the rear wheel, that means if the motor is powering the bike, I could still shift these rear gears at the back here to allow me to take advantage of the power band of the motor and have it always in the correct RPM range. Okay, so this is the motor I'm planning to power this bicycle with. Uh, this is straight out of a treadmill. It's a brush DC motor capable of nearly 2,000 watts of output uh, power. And basically what I'm going to do is gonna, I'm going to have it mounted uh, right underneath the seat post here. And it's probably going to be bolted or welded onto the frame. Uh, by some means uh, and uh, the reason why I want to keep it all the way up here though that will raise the center of gravity of the bike um, I already, I've already tested in this bicycle with the motor bolted on and it didn't really affect the handling that drastically also um, this will keep it out of the way of ingesting dust or water if we're closer to the ground uh, sometimes I've run a chain from this output sprocket on the motor shaft down to the largest sprocket on the front cassette and obviously have that chain from the smallest sprocket on the front cassette uh, driving the rear wheel. Um, now even though brush DCs, the, the brushes tend to wear down, you could always just pop them out and replace them. Um, so it won't really be that much of a hassle. I'd rather use the motor I already have than buy a, a more efficient motor like a brushless DC. Okay, so here's a closer look at the motor assembly. This is the brush uh, housing. Uh, this is a stator which contains two permanent magnets, one north and the other south. Um, Permanent magnets are really important for this kind of application because it allows this motor to function as a generator. Um, basically, if the motor is unpowered and the rotor is spinning past these magnets, uh, the magnets will induce a voltage in the coils of the rotor and that will provide electricity which I will use to recharge the battery. In other types of motors, such as like a brushless DC, uh, the stator houses uh, coils of wire instead of permanent magnets and you will need to separately power those up um, to use it as a generator. So this is more efficient, just having permanent magnets in the stator. Um, in terms of the rotor, I had to modify it by putting it into, into a lathe and I basically drilled out um, and tapped this hole with a, an M12 uh, tap 
a left-handed M12. And basically that allows me to screw in this, which is basically a bolt with a 9 tooth sprocket uh, welded onto the head of the bolt. And the reason why it's left-handed is because this motor will spin clockwise, and if it was normally threaded, then it will just unscrew itself. Obviously, all the holes, uh, the vent holes, will have to be covered somehow. I'm planning to use an automotive um, air filter material to cover these holes to prevent water from passing through the motor and frying it. So to get an idea of how fast this e-bike will actually be able to travel, um, I have to understand the kV rating of the motor or the velocity constant which is basically how fast the motor will spin in a given for a given voltage so I'm measuring this battery here uh, which is at 20.17 volts and I'll hook up the motor I just showed you to this battery and measure how fast it's spinning and divide that rpm value by 20.17 to figure out its velocity constant okay so to get the velocity constant for this motor um, I have a tachometer all wired up here and this tachometer functions with this um, due to this Hall effect sensor. And basically this detects our, um, whenever a magnet slides past the Hall effect sensor, it sends a signal. Um, so I have a magnet stuck onto the shaft of the motor. And as the magnet um, moves past the end of the Hall effect sensor, it will get picked up. Um, and that's how it measures, the device measures the RPM. And so the, I have the motor hooked up to a 20 volt battery, which is currently reading 20.15 volts DC. And so whatever the RPM is, I'll divide the RPM by 20.15 to find the velocity constant. Alrighty, so I have the motor running right now. So I'll bring the Hall effect sensor close to the magnet. You can see we're getting 1,250 RPM, roughly. So I'll divide uh, that value by the voltage, which is 20.15. Okay, so dividing the RPM by the voltage applied to the motor, I got a KV number of 63.36. And this number basically means that for every volt applied to the motor, the motor will turn by 63.36 RPM. Um, so this will come in very useful later because it will help me understand what kind, uh, how much voltage I need in the battery pack um, to get the bike up to a desired speed. So the next thing I did is I calculated all the uh, drivetrain ratios. Um, and so basically, I calculated the gearing uh, starting from the motor um, all the way back to the rear wheel. So how you calculate this is you basically divide the uh, driven gear, uh, number of teeth on the driven gear, by the number of teeth on the driving gear. So on the motor, there's nine teeth. Um, and on the first gear that um, the chain connects to, there's 48 teeth. And then the 48th tooth is on the same uh, axle as the 18th tooth and the 18 tooth drives the 28 tooth, which is on the rear cassette. Um, so for all, in all of these cases, uh, these three numbers are the same. The only thing that changes is the number of teeth on the gear on the rear cassette. So um, six, since my rear cassette has six gears, it goes from 28 all the way down to 14. And so I calculated the number, uh, the drivetrain ratio for each of the six gears. And then I use these numbers and I plug them into this online calculator. And so basically what this allows me to do is um, understand how fast, what the RPM of the motor will have to be for that um, to achieve a desired speed with the given uh, drivetrain ratio. So for example, um, if I want to achieve 25 miles per hour on the bicycle, I plug in my tire diameter, which is 26 inches, and then I also plug in the drivetrain transmission ratio, and it tells me that the motor will have to spin at 2,680 feet RPM. And since I've already calculated the KV rating, uh, the KV number, I'll just divide this RPM value by the KV to give me the voltage I need to get to 25 miles per hour with on that gear. And so I've created this table here of common e-bike battery voltages, 40 volt, 50 volt, and 60 volt. And with the, with the KV I calculated and all the different uh, drivetrain ratios, these are the speeds I could get um, and this will help me determine how um, how much voltage I need in the battery pack to actually uh, achieve those speeds. It's important to note that um, all these calculations are only theoretical. Um, this is all based on the KV rating of the motor under zero load. Um, however, obviously on the bicycle, uh, there's going to be my weight, the weight of the bicycle, and also the weight of the motor itself and the battery pack that's um, adding resistance. Um, so. 
I'm gonna give a lot of margin room, but this is a good. This is is supposed to give me a ballpark idea of uh, the voltage range I need, and also how fast I could expect to go uh, for each gear on the bicycle. Okay, so now that I have an idea of how much voltage the battery pack will need, I also need an idea of how many amps I could push through uh, this motor. And so I measured the diameter of one of the, uh, the copper wires, and it turned out to be 0 0.035 inches. And I consulted this online chart, which tells me the maximum rated amps um, per gauge of wire. And the closest one I could find um, had a maximum rating of 14 amps. And so in the circuitry, I'll limit the maximum rated amps that the battery could push out uh, to maybe 13 amps. And I'll do that just to prevent the motor from overheating and uh, internally shorting. And that's basically just to prolong the life of the motor. Okay, so since the upper amp limit is 14 amps, I'm going to limit the amp output to the motor to 13 amps. Um, and to calculate the battery range, our battery capacity, I'll have to use this formula here. Volt times amp hours equals watt hours, and watt hours is the battery gives gives me the battery capacity. So I'll now definitely build a battery pack which is around the 50 volt range because that allows me to achieve the desired speeds. Um, and I want this bike to be able to um, last for a full hour um, if the throttle is completely maxed out. So let's say um, the throttle is completely open and there's 13 amps which is right at the upper limit of the max amps I'm allowing to go to the motor the battery should be able to last a full hour on full throttle um, so plugging that in that means I'll need a battery capacity of around 650 watt hours um, now since obviously I won't be going full throttle all the time um, that would significantly increase the amount of um, hours that the battery will last for and because it only takes around 250 watts for the average cyclist to maintain a cruising speed, uh, that means the time that it will take for the battery to deplete will take 2.6 2 hours instead of uh, 1 hour in full throttle. But if I want to go full throttle, I'll have a full hour before the battery depletes. So I'm completely guessing here, but I think uh, based on my intuition, that's a good range or good capacity for this battery. Having 2.6 hours... Um, of range uh, just going at normal cruising speed. Another thing I'm planning to have on this bike is regenerative braking. So um, even though the motor can act like a generator when I'm just pedaling normally and recharge the battery, when I'm braking, um, in order to stop quickly and utilize that um, energy that would otherwise be wasted, I'm planning to use uh, these smaller motors, one in the rear wheel and another one on the front wheel. Uh, and as the brake caliper closes, this wheel will come into contact with the rim and it will spin up and generate current. Um, and I'm going to route that back into the battery and also have it light up um, a brake light as well. I'm planning to design this so that the motor actually comes into contact with the wheel rim before the brake pads do. So this should not only uh, allow me to generate current but also save on the amount of wear on the brake pads as well. Okay, so that's it for this video. In the next video, I'm going to be showing you how I'm going to modify the front cassette to integrate the freewheel. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for part two.